dress so scary. It's Halloween. Katie, if you don't dress slutty, that is slut shaming us. Guys, this is a bad movie. I wish, as someone who is a fan of the original, that I had better news for you, but unfortunately, I don't. So Mean Girls, the original film came out way back in 2024. It stars Lindsay Lohan, Tina Fey, Amanda Seyfried, and actually quite a few other actors who since then have gone on to do great things with their careers. And in the 20 years since the film was released, it's basically become a cult classic. And for good reason, if you ask me, I think it's well written, it's well acted, it's heartfelt, it's funny. Really, if you haven't seen that movie yet, I highly recommend that you do because it's unironically one of my favorite films. And it's one of the few films that I know of where even upon repeat viewing, it can actually make me laugh out loud. And on the third day, God created the Remington Bull Action Rifle so that man could fight the dinosaurs and the homosexuals. Amen. Which is basically the opposite of Mean Girls 2024, which even upon initial viewing failed to make me laugh out loud. And now if you're not familiar with the backstory behind Mean Girls 2024, uh, it's actually not just a remake of the original film. It is a film adaptation of the Broadway musical adaptation of the original film. Yeah, that's right. We are not just talking about a remake today. It is a musical remake. And I can already see some of your comments asking, Lauren, how on earth did you imagine that this could possibly be good? And it's like, guys, sometimes I can be optimistic, okay? Sometimes. I'm almost always disappointed, but still, hope can sometimes prevail. Now, the plot of Mean Girls 2024 is basically the same as the original. We are introduced to the character of Katie Heron, who is a teen that's grown up being homeschooled in Africa, and her life is kind of upended when her family moves back stateside, and she has to, for the first time, attend a public school, specifically a high school where she is forced to deal with things that she's never had to before, like... Choking. You're learning things now that I don't know how to teach. Clicks, toxic mean girl situations, dating crushes, you know the drill. And now the biggest difference between this remake and the original film, obviously, is the music, so let's start there. I know that musical taste is subjective, but in my humble opinion, this music is, it's not good. In terms of how the actual songs sound, to be honest with you, I immediately forgot each and every one of them as soon as the song itself ended. And by the time I walked out of that theater, I could not have for the life of me hummed back any of the songs to you. I mean, maybe the Regina George song that was also in the trailer, but that's basically it. These songs were extremely, extremely forgettable. I mean, I suppose they didn't sound terrible in the moment as I was hearing them, but they also weren't actively good, which I would hope your songs would be. And so when it comes to musicality, at best, these songs are forgettable. And in terms of the writing, what they actually bring to the story, well, the answer is absolutely nothing. You see, musical numbers can be a great thing to include in a film if they're able to give more insight to a character's emotional state. They're also useful sometimes for providing exposition to the audience. When used properly, musical numbers can actually elevate a story or enhance a plot line. They absolutely do not do that here. There is no character or situation or scene that is enhanced by a musical number that's been shoehorned into this film. For example, there's an entire song in this film about dressing sexy for Halloween. And no, I am not kidding. I can be This song, if you ask me, is not funny. It doesn't add anything to the plot or the story, and it doesn't even sound good, which should be the bare minimum for a song. We have more to talk about, but first I do want to tell you all about a very exciting Blaze original mini documentary that is out right now, starring Glenn Beck about the real story of Colony Ridge. So Blaze TV is debuting the second episode of our docuseries Blaze original, where Glenn travels to the quickly evolving Liberty County, Texas, to give you guys the real story of Colony Ridge. Ridge. Colony Ridge is growing fast, and I'm talking about extremely fast at a rate of 200 lots per week. And based on what Glenn has observed firsthand, the overwhelming percentage of residents are Spanish speaking non citizens. Glenn spoke with the developer, John Harris, and while he stated approximately 35,000 people live there, the local officials contradicted him, estimating the actual population is more than twice that. So if nothing is done about this, there will be hundreds of thousands of people living in Colony Ridge in just a few years' time. And that is where you folks come in, both the left and right-wing media have given vastly conflicting reports on Colony Ridge and Blaze TV couldn't have traveled there to get you the real story without your support. 
This documentary is only the beginning of our Blaze original series, exposing corruption and what's really going on in our country. And we can't do these productions without your help. And that's why if you aren't already a subscriber of Blaze TV, subscribe now for $30 off an annual subscription by visiting blazeoriginals.com and using code Colony Rich. And in this episode, Glenn addresses all the rumors and brings you the truth. Is Colony Rich specifically targeting illegal immigrants to take up residency? How is this new favela style development impacting basic utilities and services like water and sewage? What is the toll on the existing residents? And finally, is any of this legal? Colony Ridge poses an enormous threat to the future of this country. And again, we could not have made the real story of Colony Ridge without your support. So if you want to see this episode and future installments, help support the work we're doing by visiting blazeoriginals.com today and subscribe using the code Colony Ridge for $30 off your annual subscription. And sadly, not only do these songs not add anything to the story, but in some cases, they actively take away from it. For example, one of the most pivotal scenes in the film of both the original and the remake is when Katie Heron is convinced finally that yeah Regina George is evil and she agrees to uh, go along with Janice and Damien and basically try to undermine her social power. When you think of it, this is a pretty dark scene because here you have three people who are basically plotting the downfall of another person. And I guess the people behind the Mean Girls musical realized that and so they decided to uh, add a song to this situation, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. But instead of maybe going down the route of having a hardcore, just banging villain song, which are always the best songs in musicals or movies, where maybe Damien and Katie and Janice could be relishing the idea of tearing Regina George down, but also perhaps struggling with the fact that objectively what they're doing is pretty manipulative and evil in and of itself, even if they think it's somehow justified because Regina is a bad person. Instead of something like that, the people behind this musical inserted a number called Revenge Party, which is for some reason an upbeat little ditty that has the most vapid lyrics you could possibly imagine. And there's a magic act that saws Regina in half, and this time it'll take. Now that's a party. It's a revenge party, a party that ends somebody's head on the spot. That's not good writing. That's not funny. That's not good music. There's just why? Why is this here? And that's a criticism I have basically all of the songs in this musical. The lyrics are all terrible. And I know that even the Broadway musical that this was adapted from is supposed to be a comedy. So everything's supposed to be funny, but still something can be meaningful and funny at the same time. And unfortunately, even when the music is trying to be serious and emotional, it's still terrible. One of the songs that's included in this film is a musical number sung by the character of Gretchen Wiener, where she kind of dissects her toxic friendship with Regina George. George. I like the premise of this song. That's actually a character dynamic uh, situation that's worth exploring more. However, sadly, the lyrics in this song are so terrible, so shallow, we learn absolutely nothing about the character of Gretchen Wiener or her internal conflict over remaining Regina George's friend, even though Regina treats her poorly because she feels like she has to stay in the plastics to maintain maybe some, some social standing. Like, did someone's kid write these lyrics or something? Is that why they're in the movie? Because honestly, if that were the case, I would look upon them more favorably than the idea that an actual adult, a professional, sat down, wrote these, and were like, yeah, that's good enough. Let's include that in a multi-million dollar movie. Also, another problem I have with the songs here, and yeah, I know, I have a lot of problems with these songs, is that they undercut the best parts of the original movie. And another song that I found especially terrible for several reasons, which we will go through, is the song called I'd Rather Be Me. Now, the first issue I have with this song is its placement in the film. Another pivotal scene in the original, a really important part of the movie, is after the burn book is released and all of the girls have this I guess, workshop to stop bullying each other in the gymnasium. That scene kind of culminates with Regina George storming out of the gym after she learns that Katie was basically a double agent the entire time, after which uh, Katie chases after Regina and tries to apologize to her. It's an emotional scene because it's here that Regina essentially realizes that it's not just that Katie was kind of betraying her, it's that almost everyone in the school hates her. For some reason, the people behind the musical decided to cut that scene out almost entirely and replace it with a song sung by Janice about female empowerment. I'm not even kidding. We're supposed to all be ladies and be nurturing and care. Is that really fair? Boys get to fight, we have to share. 
Oh, boo-hoo. The whole premise of Mean Girls, at least the original film, is addressing toxic femininity, the manipulative ways that women can treat each other. It's an important issue, it's an important lesson that a lot of girls, myself included, have to grapple with uh, while going through their teenage years. But in this song, which again replaces one of the most important interactions of the film between uh, Regina and Katie, Janice instead is singing about how basically gender roles are to blame for everything. It's not boys who are forcing girls to go around talking badly about each other behind each other's backs. This messaging makes absolutely no sense if there were a film or a scenario that very clearly explained how, yeah, sometimes women are just responsible for their own problems and situations because of their misconduct. It would be mean girls, but here they're trying to rope in feminism and it just, it doesn't fit. It doesn't make sense. One thing I will say as a positive for this film is that the songs are very well performed. I think everyone has a great voice, especially the actress who plays Regina George. She sounds amazing. I think that's probably the case because it seems like the people who were behind the casting prioritized singing ability over acting ability, because that's another issue that I have with this film. Uh, it's just, it's not as funny as the original, which is almost hard to believe because they kept a lot of the original jokes in this film. A lot of the script has remained the same, but honestly, I think the final product would have been better here if they had gotten people who were maybe not quite as good at singing, but who were better comedic actors? There were so many jokes that were absolute bangers in the original film that were completely butchered in this remake because of poor comedic timing. And honestly, I feel like people in general underestimate how hard it is to be funny in film, to be a comedic actor. A lot of people will lose their minds like, oh, this amazing dramatic performance. It's hard though to have a comedic performance that actually makes people laugh. And unfortunately, I feel like a lot of the actors in this film, they were chosen maybe because of their singing abilities, but the comedic performances, they just were not there. Not only that, I don't know if it's because this film is a Broadway adaptation and the script was maybe meant for Broadway or the director was used to Broadway or maybe the actors themselves were used to Broadway, but a, a lot of the delivery overall, it was just more Broadway acting than film acting, which is to say things were kind of overacted at some points. When you're watching a play, I feel like because of the setting, you know, you have to suspend disbelief because obviously you can see that th this is not a real situation happening and you're far away and it's harder to hear. There's a tendency toward overacting that can work. With film and TV, on the other hand, I feel like more subtle performances tend to flourish, unfortunately performances here were kind of all over the place. A lot of the scenes just felt very hammy and a lot more Broadway than they were in the original film where they felt more natural. Additionally, uh, I would like to address the diversity of it all because it's been 20 years since the original Mean Girls film, which of course means that uh, everybody is browner and gayer in the remake. Several characters have been race swapped, uh, including Damien, uh, Katie's gay friend, uh, Karen, the stupid slutty plastic. In the original film, the character of Janice is also Lebanese. In the remake, she's played by, I think, a Hawaiian actress. And also in the original film, Janice is straight, but as a form of bullying, she is called a lesbian. In the 2024 Mean Girls, Janice is actually a lesbian. And it's interesting because watching the film, I did notice that there were a lot of jokes about being gay that were also removed. Ha! Gay! It seems like overall the writers wanted to stay away from the idea that being gay was something that uh, teens would ever be bullied for. I can understand why they did that, but even in the original film, the message is not that it's okay to bully people for being gay. That's not the message at all. The message is that it's not okay to be bullied for any reason. But I feel like in 2024, because we're so PC, we don't even want to have scenes where people are being bullied for being gay, even if it's to show that it's wrong, just because you would have to bully a gay person to do that. Also, something that I was surprised to see is that even though this remake is happening in a high school setting in 2024, they really don't use social media well in the film. I think a an updated Mean Girls would have a lot to say about how social media and even cyberbullying fits into all the Mean Girl attitudes and cliques. But that's really not touched upon in this film. I mean, there were some cursory attempts to be like, hey, we're going to have people filming themselves, you know, because 
TikTok. It's the most superficial thing ever. I remember in the original film, three-way calls are something that the plastics use as a way to uh, let people hear when others speak badly about them. And it's used in the film to illustrate how backstabby girls can be sometimes. I'm not sure what the Gen Z equivalent of that is because I sure as heck know we're not doing three-way calls anymore. But I feel like it would have been good to try to explore that, explore how social media has changed friendships, has changed cliques. I mean, I feel like in 2024, a Mean Girls adaptation should probably have touched upon something like, well, what if someone's nudes got leaked with revenge porn? Are we sharing screenshots of sensitive conversations that were supposed to be uh, said in confidence. None of that is included here, and I feel like that is a missed opportunity. And finally, ultimately, my biggest complaint about this film is that it was just not entertaining. Again, this is a film that, despite my best instincts, I was actually kind of looking forward to, but after the first 20 minutes or so, I was actively looking forward to it ending. Someone beside me left the theater halfway through, which almost never happens. But anyway, uh, those are just my thoughts. Obviously not a fan. Here is what Papa Chen has to say about the movie, and yes, I did I did bring him to see this. The truth, I was shocked. I never seen such a rubbish movie in the last 15, 20 years. That was completely garbage. In my opinion, the story was not well written. And also the musical, that was just noise and screaming. And as a matter of fact, very annoying. I was hoping when's the movie gonna end. Right now, I never see any movie as bad as this one. But lucky, they only spent less than $40 million. But I think they can make the money back though. Because I see and see a lot of like a young teenager, like 12, 13, they may like it. Not they may like it, they want to see. But they will be disappointed. I, I just don't know what the directors and the producers, they were thinking to make a movie of this type, you know, because they, <laughs> they, I have no reason. But actually, when they see, before they start shooting the movie, they must have a script. But when they see the script, that was pure garbage. You, it's not worth seeing it. Even if it's free on Netflix or Prime, don't waste your time. You really don't waste your time. So, Mean Girls 2024, have you seen it? And if so, what did you think? Let us know down below. That's basically all I have to say for now, though. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Until next time.